something about the script that really touched home, and it really it, it felt like felt like something I would write, and that that. Uh, and I love Thailand as well. I love the idea of going out there and having this adventure. But there was something in, in the screenplay about the two brothers that I really connected with. And it felt like something that could be a fantastic movie. You know, that you always look for something that can, that can be bigger than it really is. And uh, I think with the Fifth Commandment, I think this was you know, a prime example of that script form. Uh, so that's, that's how I met, that's how I met Rick. You know. uh, <laughs> no, actually, uh, you know, got the call from Jesse. Uh, of course, you know, Jesse and I have, you know, worked on many projects together before. He had used me before as a stunt coordinator and second year director on some other films. Um, so he called me up and said, you know, I've got a really amazing project. It's, you know, driven by not only action, but story. And wait until you see this. And, you know, on top of it all, we've got an action star, you know, a really bona fide, great acting action star that's just going to go and, you know, uh, blow your doors off, Eric. Wait until you see it. I mean, unfortunately, the truth is he wasn't my first call. <laughs> reason was I didn't think I could afford Garrett and uh, I'd, I'd sort of beat around the bush and I'd sort of mentioned the script to him and I said there's some really good stuff in here you know it's Rick Hewn he's fantastic it's 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 Bangkok and, and Garrett's like yeah well, you know it's a long time away from home and he, he does big movies Garrett does huge huge movies and it's one of the in probably world-class stuntman at the moment and w definitely a world-class choreographer fight choreographer and, and second unit action director so uh, it finally came down to the wire and I, I basically begged and you know, after a while, Rick had met him, and we, you know, they started training a little bit, and we, we said, we've got to have you. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, it felt like something I would have written. You know, uh, it, there were elements in there about the father and the son relationship that are very, very important to me. I didn't have a dad growing up, and uh, I, I had this Freud there the whole time, and I think that was almost what drove me to making these high-octane action films in the first place. And it, here we've got a film that touches on all of these elements, the family element, that really, you know, because an action film without an emotional content is a complete waste of time. It's pornography. If you have if you have the emotional content to pull it all together, suddenly you've got something that's interesting. People are people are watching. They're in, involved in it. And what I felt with this one was you had the perfect balance of emotional acting, storyline, character-driven stuff, and you had these awesome sequences which we could do you know some real fun stuff with. And I mean, it was going to be a challenge. It was also going to be terrifyingly ambitious, and it, and it, that never stopped. It just got more ambitious the more we sort of peeled back the onion layers and saw what we actually had to deal with. Uh, but it was it was. It, it was primarily the character and the emotion of this story about two brothers that, that, that are brought up by a hitman who is a bad man but can't help himself for being a good, generous guy. And I love these contradictions. And, and we've got an, ass an assassin who spends the movie trying to stop someone from getting killed. We've got a hitman, you know, we've got a, we've got a bodyguard who spends the movie, you know, uh, try, trying to help out. An assassin, and then we've got a hitman who's trying to, you know, protect his two sons. So you've got all these wonderful contradictions. I think that makes for exciting, you know, really exciting storytelling. So that was what really sort of brought me in, and, it, and I couldn't put the script down. I read it very, very quickly. Instantly started putting together storyboards and ideas. What we can do here? How can we, you know, how we can do this? And uh, when we got to Thailand, of course, that, you know, it became a very, very rich environment for coming up with action sequences and. You know, we'd look at a set, we'd go on a scout to the set, it's like, that's okay. And then the production designer, who was a wonderful guy called Steve Spence, who did some of the Bond movies, said, well, come and have a look at this other place I found. And, and it, it just got better and better. So it was a really, really fun, fun movie to make. As far as the action sequences in the movie, we had some of the most, um, you know, interesting approaches to doing the action. First of all, you know, the star of the movie, Rick Yoon, um, had already done his homework on a number of things. So aside from him, you know, drawing from great movies such as the Born Identity, uh, Man on Fire, uh, The Professional, he also came in with a fight style. He wanted to do something different than anybody had done before. And it's a thing called the 52 block system, which is a system that was developed by you know criminals or prisoners, let me say, inside of prisons. Um, really very interesting. Always had to have a rhythm to it. You know, there was always a sense of beat and there's always this uh, you know, poetic nature to it where it wasn't just created out of some art form that you paid for and some guy taught you. It was something that was created out of a need to stay alive inside of a closed space. Um, something that was generated out of the street, which is who his character was. So, you know, when it came to doing the fight scenes, it wasn't just like doing some movies, fight scenes. It was about, you know, translating this interesting um, interpretation of what his character was through the action. It was amazing, it was awesome. And then on top of that, you know, Jesse has got this, you know, 
deviant side of him, and let me say it right now, okay, that is just driven by action. You know, so as much as he's amazing as far as shooting, and he won't say it now either, so I can say it, shooting, you know, amazing dialogue and, you know, character-driven performances, he's also got this amazing side at, you know, drilling someone with bullets, you know, and, you know, crashing cars and explosions, and, you know, it's really this, you know, adrenaline rush when you get to work with him on top of this you also have this action star, Rick, who's, you know, driven by that same kind of adrenaline rush. It's truly an art form for anybody that likes action. The interesting thing we did before we started that, that Garrett and I did, an, and Rick as well, did an enormous amount of research into what was coming out of the Far East, what was coming out of Hong Kong, Thailand, Korea, with regard to action movies, from Old Boy from Korea to Ong Bak with Tony Jaa that was, actually came out of Thailand. And then, and, and really, really soaking all that up. And what they were doing that we weren't seeing in, in, in the West was they were, they were letting the action talk for itself. They were, they'd pull back and they'd give you a wide angle. They'd take the time and they'd rehearse with these actors and you'd see, you'd see these moves and it was exciting. It was kept flowing. Uh, and then, you know, by, by, you know, you know, in, in, in the West, what you see is a lot of very, very long lens, handheld, you know, sort of wobble cam which is fun, it's, it's very off the moment of the zeitgeist and it's fashionable and it's interesting. But the audience, I think, is gonna start feeling a little bit sort of cheated, you know, because you, you're, not, you're not getting to see technique, you're not getting to see the real action. So we thought that an, a happy medium of the two was gonna be the way to make the Fifth Commandment really different and really sort of blend these styles. And it's sort of apropos to be shooting a film in Bangkok with a style of choreography that blends East and West. And uh, we were very careful to do that. We didn't wanna get in, and also with Rick, because he actually does is a master of this kind of martial arts and, and took to it very quickly and had his own opinions and worked with Garrick fantastically. And, and we had also Roger Yuan, who is a, a fabulous martial artist. We were able to bring the camera back and we were able to show a lot of this stuff and technique and, and blend these styles to a degree that I think is, is interesting and, and, and varied and not, not the random stuff that you're seeing on almost every movie that's coming out at the moment out, out here, which is fun and it's exciting. But I think in about you know, a couple of years time, it's gonna look very dated and uh, and a, and, a, and a little bit boring, really. Uh, so we, we were careful with that. It was it was fun to do that. You know. And Garrett, Garrett had to. I mean, it was incredible. We were location scouting and putting putting stuff together, and to watch him go through these Thai stunt guys training them. How many did you see in the end? Probably six or seven hundred of these guys. We were told they were the best in the world, and some of them are. But but he had to see an awful lot of people before he got to the really good guys. I mean, it was incredible the amount of rehearsal time and, and, and work that went into these, these sequences. I mean, uh, And no air conditioning. Training them, uh, the humidity that, that, that and, and you know, that was just the training gym. When we actually got to the sets, you know, we, we were dealing with the final fight sequence, which is about 50, 45 feet up with no, nothing underneath and everything's rusty and falling apart. You know, and Rick's up there doing, doing you know, hanging off the edge and, and doing martial arts. I mean, it was really, really a fantastic adventure. And, you know, hair raising, and you don't have the same sort of safety standards there. I mean, they're wonderful people, and they, 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 they have their own way of doing things, but it was different. It was a different environment for us all. It was really uh, quite, quite, quite something. So I, I, think, I think at some point we have to say something about our, our fearless leader and the fact that we had, a, uh, we had a lead actor who was doing his own stunts. He was writing the movie. He was one of the producers dealing with financiers, and he was dealing with the locations, because we didn't have a location scout. So, so Rick, I knew, was probably sleeping about an hour to two hours a night, uh, pulling together the money, pulling together European, you know, European and, and American finances. Who we'd, we'd see them coming through various, and we didn't know what was going on. We'd, we'd see him talking to them in the trailer and going out. What we didn't realize was that he was keeping us afloat as we're going along financially, and uh, then dealing with everyone from the Chinese mobsters, I think, to the, you know, to, to the Bangkok Film Commission, to just about everyone you can imagine, and Warner then, and, also and then costumes. coming to set. And having to learn these enormous fight routines, know his lines, you know, be in character, be on, you know, be be cheerful because he, everyone's looking to him. And then, just to add to it, if anything changed, the poor guy was off in his trailer rewriting dialogue for the. It was incredible to watch. I mean, uh, I have not seen it. I've worked with Tom Cruise, I've worked with Johnny Depp, I've worked with all these different actors, but I have not seen a level of commitment like that. And just for that, I think everyone should watch The Fifth Commandment and enjoy it and know it because this is this is the work of of a, a martial arts Orson Welles, and I think. Uh, I think uh, it's, there's not going to be many people that know that when they see the film because he did it so well. And I, that's, that's the only sort of sad part about this. You know. Yeah, well, if you really want to talk about fun stuff, we did a car chase in the street, and then we weren't supposed to keep on doing the chase in certain areas of the street, but we did. 
<laughs> so, uh, and then we lost the tire, and we still continued to do the car chase. And uh, you know, another point I think we need to make is that you know Rick did all of his own stunt driving. So if you guys do see the Fifth Commandment, you'll see actually Rick in this BMW getting sideswiped. And actually, yeah, uh, I don't know if they've got behind the scenes footage of Garrett and I watching the monitor on that, but we were watching. And Rick's, Rick's behind us, and he hit the other car, went up at 45 degrees, and both of us, our eyes, I think it took a few minutes for our eyes to recover. It was His eyes, I'm like, eye. Heart came out of your mouth. It was incredible. I mean, uh, absolutely fearless. Yeah, I'm actually, sorry. I think the tire actually got, came up by his driver's window. Like, the car is like right here in his yeah. face, and Rick's just over like this, it, not it, caring. It, 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 was, it was a gradual sort of process. You know, I remember being on, I think we were on the 10th floor of a uh, apartment where we did the opening sequence, and it was a, it was a gag. You know, originally it was written as a... Uh, very, very high descender, but we knew that was going to be very problematic. Garrett and I worked with a stuntman that did a thing called a base jump, which is a low opening uh, uh, parachute where you jump with the, with the pilot in your hand. Uh, so we called him, we, you know, uh, the producers went about finding a guy that could do it. He couldn't do it, so we found someone, I think they found someone in Belgium who came in in the end. But Rick had to fake the beginning of this jump. And so we're filming out, you know, across, you know, across, across downtown Bangkok. Luckily, we had a floor, I think it was two floors below, had a, had a large veranda. So we put some pants in there. I said, Rick, all you got to do is jump out. It's only, it's only eight or 10 feet. You know, you, anyone can do it. It's very, very easy. And he, he went up and he looked at me and, you know, I could see, I could see there was a little sort of, you know, little sort of distraction, but he did it. He did it three takes. Oh, great, great. You know, around about after I'd cut, you know, shouted cut, about five minutes later, I went and looked out over the edge and I realized that what I'd asked him to do, okay, he was, <laughs> it was only about eight feet to that platform, but if he'd, if he'd over jumped by, Six or eight inches. It was, it was about 95 uh, feet down to the next deck. Was, oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. looking over the edge, made my heart go. It's like I just asked him to do it three times, but uh, it was one of those things. You know, you, you, it's funny. It was a long shoot, but it ended up being a very frantic one. We had a we had a huge, huge crew that would follow us around because things things happen differently. And in, 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 you know, out there, you, you have six people to move this and eight people to move that, and it just logistically takes time to move from one place to another. You can move a lot quicker with a small American crew, but over there you get a lot of quality, but it just takes time. So even though we had a little bit longer schedule, things, things were going very quickly. So uh, it, was, it was an interesting, interesting shoot. And I think there was, a, there was a few other little sequences like that. I think we, we had, yeah, I think you may have heard about the primer cord explosion on the door. Now that was an interesting one. Uh, we had to blow this door open. And uh, you know, we'd, we'd done one dry one that hadn't gone very well. And I talked to the special effects guy, Samson, who was very, very concerned about hurting Rick. And I said, have you got anything bigger? He said, no, no, you know, nothing. I said, we, you know, finally, it took sort of really ballsing the guy out, saying, what have you got that can go bigger? Well, I've got this Chinese industrial primer cord, but we don't really use it on movies. It's like, that's it. Put it in the door. Wrap it around there. Put eight feet of it in there, whatever you can. And it, you, know, you, you hear very, you know, complete silence from the whole special effects crew. And, and they look at Rick, and Rick's the producer, and he nods his head, and you know, neither of us knew the extent of what eight feet of you know, Chinese primer cord does. I don't think anyone there had ever seen that much in one small space. Uh, and when this thing went off, honestly, I think it made the roof go up and down about six or eight inches. I mean, you, 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 you probably heard it in, in, in Cambodia. It was unbelievable. Yeah, there's no CG. It was unbelievable. That one. You don't see it. But, it was one sequence, and Rick had to charge through the room, shooting all these guys after the door blown out. And I honestly thought we'd vaporize them. I thought we were going to find a shadow on the wall, like in Hiroshima. Uh, but sure enough, the, the cloud came out, and Rick came out of the cloud and pop, 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 shot the guys. Looked at me and said, "You want to do another one?" It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about the well, stunt my... guys too? We knocked, a, we knocked a couple of stunt guys that were right in front of that door these, for a loop. These guys came off their feet and went back about four or five feet and landed on their, you know, backsides, and you know. I was like, good jump. And I said, jump, 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 what? <laughs> they got back up. It was and like, absolutely got one terrifying. Hard. It was, it was un unbelievable. And it was just awesome. And yeah. it's one of the sequences I'm most proud of in the movie. I think it, it came out really, really well. And it was a, uh, it was, you know, Garrett had an acting part in it, you know. Uh, and I think it just went, it was just terrific. And, you know, for that, I'm proud of the movie for that sequence. Uh, uh, and the base jump is terrific. Came together, you know, came together really, really well. So it was fun. It was a fun one. I mean, my, my thing about CG is if, if it's completely seamless and you can't see it, that's great. And you have, you're not aware of it, but you're dealing with a very, very erudite and educated audience now. Most of these guys play an awful lot of video games. They watch an awful lot of movies. They know what's capable. Most of them have, have the plugins and drop-ins on their computer. They can do it themselves. If you're going to do CG and it looks like CG, then you're making a different kind of movie than the kind I want to watch. I want to watch movies that put me on the edge of my seat, throw my popcorn in the air and get my heart in my throat and I, you know, 
hold your nose and kick you in the pants and don't let go till, till you're walking out the theater door, as Billy Wilder said. You know, I want to know, I want, I want to be in jeopardy with my, with my protagonist, you know. Uh, so that's my opinion on it. I'm not a big fan of, you know, the CG that you're completely aware of. I, I don't care about cars landing on the roof of a train and then skidding off or motorcycles flying over the moon. You know, it's, it's all, that's not the kind of movie I ever wanted to make. And uh, I think with this film, Garrett and I and, and Rick were very, very conscientious of the fact we wanted to do something that felt perilous, looked like it hurt people, and it, and it certainly does, I think, and, uh, and basically just push, push the boundaries of what, was, what, what could be done in the old-fashioned sense of stunts, but modernized with an interesting, edgy, you know, contemporary look to it. Well, you know, I mean, I, I do an awful lot of work with special effects, uh, so as far as visual effects or concerned. Um, you know, I'm not against them. I think that they're great when they're needed and uh, whatever the movie is that uses them, you know, God bless them if they do them very well. Um, I am, however, a big fan of, you know, the old school approach. You know, I personally thought Jaws was great when you have a robotic Jaws, you know, robot versus, you know, a computer generated one that someone's just thinking about, you know, being there instead of having something to actually tangibly touch, you know. Um, you know, I was a big fan of the first Star Wars versus, you know, the computer-generated ones. But nonetheless, still love all those movies. Yeah, we're this, not Luddites. You yeah. don't worship the past for the sake right. of worshiping the past. But I think there are tools that are being lost in the filmmaking industry because people can rely on special effects. Right. You know, I have to remember Mary Poppins, bed knobs and broomsticks, all these wonderful pictures where people were floating around. You know, and these were old, old school effects, and it could be done. There were ways of doing this. Even the first Superman, you know, with Christopher Reeve. The, 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 there, there are ways of doing everything that's being done with special effects. And if you read books and you do your history and you understand about films and plate, you know, glass map painting and things like that, there's, there's a, you know, there's a science there, and it's wonderful, and it's beautiful, and it's left over from theatre before movies. And if you can, if you can understand that, and educate yourself, you can use CG in a way that's organic and interesting and feels right. edgy. Yeah. You know. I think using it because you're lazy is always going to look lazy, you know. Right. And it's also uh, complete, you know, uh, it's completely wrong to think that it's going to be cheaper than doing the stunt because in actual fact, especially if you're going to a film print like this film is, you know, theatrical, and you, you go and actually look how much that CG is going to cost, it would have been cheaper to have done the gag as a stunt, you know, with, with, with stuntmen and pads and, you know, the old school way. But at the same token, you know, on this film, you know, one of the things we did want to try and do is stay loyal to our fans or even, you know, to that movie genre that we came out of, you know, where it was the actual, you know, stunt itself and the actual glass window. You know, we wanted to make sure that, you know, people knew that we were using real blanks, real squids, you know, real, real explosions. Real monster. Real, absolutely. And Rick was absolutely 100% in the middle of all of those things, you know. Um, there's pushing a, there's a beautiful saying. I, I, was, I was an assistant on the last uh, Indiana Jones movie, the third one. I'm sorry, not the last one, the third one. Uh, Indiana Jones and, and, and Last Crusade, and then I was the second unit action director on the TV show for a little while. And there was a saying at that time, which seems to have been lost somewhere along the way, certainly was lost in the last movie, which is, it was real life plus 10% fantasy. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful ratio to stick to when you're making this kind of movie, because if that 10% fantasy grows too big, then there's something, there's a loss there, there's a loss of sympathy, there's a loss of, you know, uh, and that's what we tried to stick to on this, Garrett. And, and we've, you know, that's been our rule of thumb for a few movies, and it's it's a, it's a good one. You know, it's uh, it's solid. It holds water. Every action sequence, you start at the top, and you say, "What can we do here?" And you throw something out there that's outrageous. You throw it backwards and forwards, and eventually you come down to earth. And you try and you try and go between somewhere between mediocre and undoable. So every. And honestly, if you're a director of action movies, a stunt coordinator, or an action movie star, every single time you're faced with an action sequence, your, your prerogative, your mandate, if you want, in life is to come up with the sequence that cannot be done. And then you all sit down, and you put your feet back on the ground, you work out, how can we do this in a way that's not going to kill anyone, you know, ruin our careers, end the movie. And you keep pushing, you keep pushing. Every take, you keep pushing. And you have to do that. And you have to, I mean, you have someone like Garrett there to say, Jess, if you do this again, this guy's going to die. Uh, but I, it's my prerogative to keep pushing and trying to make that sequence as dangerous and as hair-raising and as scary as possible. And then, you know, the, you know, working with the DP to capture that, but also trying to come up with a way that you can fake that. But, I mean, uh, you, you have to. I mean, if you, if you are going into an action movie or a sequence at the beginning of your week or your day,